Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here. So a bit about me. I know that they just gave um, sort of my bio, but I'll give my own bio. <laughs> uh, you know, I have a Finnish name, Miko, but I'm actually from New Jersey. So that's usually pretty confusing for people around here. And I was able to sneak into this conference sort of undetected because I really love saunas. And so people, uh, you know, as long as I'm not speaking, they think that I'm Finnish. Uh, and as they said before, originally I was an investor, or at least I thought I would be an investor. Uh, and so I started working at a firm called 3G Capital in New York City. Uh, it's a firm that's very well known for cutting costs. So, you know, I have some background on this subject of extending your runway. Um, and after I worked at 3G, I was asked to go to the Kraft Heinz company. And that's um, a purveyor of ketchup and uh, processed cheese and uh, you know, canned food and things like that. And that, at that company, I served as the regional CFO in China, Singapore, and the United States. Uh, and we did a lot of cost cutting. And they didn't really need to extend their runway, but we were very frugal. Um, and as they said before, my wife and I moved to London during COVID. I didn't have a job. I was looking for a job. I applied uh, for the CFO position at Revolut on LinkedIn. I was rejected uh, during the first go around, but I was able to sort of convince them to hire me and I was able to join uh, in early 2021. I worked there until this summer uh, when I joined Bolt. Bolt is sort of a local company. It's headquartered in Tallinn, just south of here. And um, it's a great business. And I've been uh, sort of loving my time uh, at Bolt since I, since I joined. So what is this talk going to be about? Uh, you know, the title is Cutting, Burn, Extending Your Runway. What we'll discuss is the theory and the practice of those things, cutting, burn, and extending your runway, uh, and as much as we can in a relatively brief period. I'm going to try to cover a bit on costs, how to cut them, and then offer a few words and thoughts on working capital and how it may be uh, optimized. And then we'll consider the difference between cash and non-cash expenses and uh, how to basically have more non-cash expenses in order to reduce your cash burn. And then I'm going to suggest a few ways to increase gross margin before giving a few final thoughts on fundraising. And so not to give it all away, but in short, you should cut your costs periodically, and it's more emotionally or politically difficult to cut costs than it is technically to execute. You should optimize working capital, which means lengthening payment terms by reducing upfront spends in favor of periodic or subscription products. It means negotiating with suppliers, and it means, you know, in, in the worst case scenario or at time, times of real need, uh, just absolutely withholding payment to people that you owe money to. Um, and it means collecting accounts receivable faster. And finally, finally you should um, focus on, on freeing trapped cash. I won't go too much into it, but you should, grow, you should improve your gross margins by focusing on pricing, variable costs, and building a SWAT team to understand unit level P&Ls. And as I said before, you should move as much as you can to non-cash expenses. Typically, that means increasing equity compensation, doing salary sacrifices, and seeing if you can pay your vendors in equity. And finally, and we can you know, get into this a little bit more, but always raise money when you don't need it, raise more money than you could conceivably need, and remember that investors are emotional and irrational. So you know, with that sort of outline, uh, that's basically all I'm going to tell you. And if you want, you can leave now, because I'm just going to go through what I just said a little bit more slowly. So costs. There's a great saying about costs, which is that they're like fingernails. They need to be cut every so often. And then the question is, how do you cut costs? My framework goes like this. should focus on establishing control, building visibility, and then leveraging your control and visibility to have influence uh, over your entire organization. So I'm going to go through that, control, visibility, and influence. 
Control means that you're in control. So no surprise. Uh, you need to know what the costs actually are. You need to control who approves purchases. And you need to control who actually pays, which is uh, you know, what I mean by that is you know, how the cash actually goes out the door. If you don't have control, a very basic method of maintaining absolute control is to control the purse strings or the bank accounts of your company. It's not a very efficient or scalable method, but it's very effective. And what I mean there is that if anyone wants to spend any money or you know, get a approval for spending any money or actually execute any payments, the absolute most of, you know, uh, assured way of having control is for you to actually be the one who does the payments or, or at least approves the, the purchase orders or, or spending. So all in all, step one is to make sure that you can confidently say what your costs are, who approves them, and who actually lets cash out the door in terms of payments. Step two is visibility. You've got to build it for the central finance and management team. You've got to build it for the owners of P&Ls throughout you know, the company. It can be business unit leaders or uh, you know, what, however you call the, the vertical general managers. And the question is, do those teams and people have reports or dashboards that allow them to understand what their costs are with the appropriate frequency? I would focus on particularly understanding areas that are easier to cut without cutting to the bone. So things like travel, marketing, entertainment, offices or office perks. And then it may make sense to, um, to leverage a concept called a, a, a cost matrix. Cost matrix can be quite effective uh, because basically you end up having more than one person responsible for any given costs. So in a cost matrix, basically, um, you know, it's like any type of matrix, but you have one axis is the type of cost, and the other axis, you know, the, the sort of vertical axis, would be the entity or the business line that is actually spending that cost. And then you tell both the person who is responsible for all spending across verticals for that type of cost and for the vertical leaders themselves that they're responsible for, for that spend. So you have two people that have to uh, approve before anyone can spend any money. And then the second thing I would say is uh, you know, don't accept any averages. Or I guess this is the third thing that I'm saying, but don't accept any averages. Rank from biggest to smallest, benchmark subdivisions, um, rather than consolidated levels. Your averages can just hide the truth, uh, and they tend to be obfuscating rather than revealing. It could be interesting to use an 80-20 rule or Pareto analysis in order to pinpoint exactly what are your biggest contributors uh, to spending or opportunities to reduce um, costs. And always, at least in my view, have some vision of um, cash spending. Don't rely only on accounting or accruals um, that don't reflect exactly the reality, especially if you're running out of cash. The third and final step is influence. Um, and it's important to focus on uh, influence and leverage in your organization. Uh, in my view, culture on costs always has to come from the top, which means that the CEO or founder uh, at least that person, hopefully that person and the CFO or someone else who's in charge of finance, uh, they need to lead. Uh, and that means, or it could mean, acting as an owner or leading by example. The classic example is uh, business class travel, you know, where I think it's fair to say that most of us, if we're flying, let's say, between Helsinki and uh, London, um, you know, it's about a two-hour flight. Uh, if it's our personal travel, there's almost no scenario where we would pay you know, the extra couple hundred euros for a business class seat, uh, especially when we, you can see that they're exactly the same as the seats in the back. Um, but you know, it's possible that at some corporation, uh, they would approve uh, you know, a flight to be in business class. And acting as an owner means uh, basically getting rid of policies that you wouldn't do if it was your own family or your own business. Uh, you can always ask for ideas and empower teams uh, to deliver savings on their own initiative. Crowdsourcing usually works. Um, I would do symbolic things. You know, I think I talk about you know, performing ritual cost cutting or sacrifice. Uh, so no printing, uh, no free food, no travel. You know, if you really want to get serious. 
Um, and then on the sort of commercial spend side, in terms of marketing or customer acquisition costs or sales teams, I would shorten the payback thresholds that you expect uh, in order to approve uh, spend there. So if normally you had an 18-month payback uh, that you wanted to see, maybe you want to go to 12 months or 9 months or even 6 months. So that's it on costs, uh, which is probably really the bulk of extending your runway. Um, but a moment on working capital, which can also be effective in terms of generating cash. And as a reminder, working capital is your inventory plus your accounts receivable minus your accounts payable. It's always better if that number is negative. Uh, if you have negative working capital, that means that you're being financed by some combination of your suppliers and customers. Effectively, they are extending you credit. Uh, and what I would say about working capital is, you know, first, don't be afraid to negotiate with your suppliers. Some version of, you know, obviously it depends on kind of the scale and the maturity of your business, but some version of a procurement team or global business team, you know, someone who's explicitly responsible for getting the lowest possible price at the highest possible quality for anything you need to buy. Um, you know, that, that team is very likely to have a, a high return on investment, at least initially. Over time, it may sort of diminish if you're actually successful in, in negotiation. Um, the second one is don't accept trapped cash. This is sort of more esoteric, but cash can basically get stuck in various bank accounts, can get stuck in agreements that you have with vendors or customers. It can get stuck uh, in all sorts of requirements. And the short thing here is just don't let it get stuck because that's a complete waste of money. Uh, and be annoying with your own team and your counterparties. You cannot afford to have trapped cash given your cost of capital and your need to extend your runway. And then depending on your business and the delinquency rates of your customers, uh, you may want to consider an internal or external collection team. Of course, there's a reputational risk to that, um, but don't let other people or companies take advantage of you. Um, cash versus non-cash expenses. And I mentioned this at the beginning. There's three, or at least here are three ways, potential ways to reduce cash, reduce cash expenses. The first is to pay your team uh, or staff in equity uh, to do some sort of a salary sacrifice. Uh, of course, you'd prefer not to do that because in the future your company is going to be worth a lot, um, but it has to exist in the future in order to be worth a lot in the future, so it's something to consider. Uh, in terms of paying your vendors in equity, it's the same story. Um, and then in terms of changing, uh, you know, my, my third suggestion here, changing your marketing or customer acquisition uh, tools to be product-based, uh, by which I mean sort of a trial basically allowing your customers to try your product for free as a way of acquiring them. Um, that can be certainly more cost effective than performance marketing. Um, of course, that depends on exactly what your product is and the effectiveness of trial-based marketing. Um, but it could be very effective if you have minimal variable costs. And finally, uh, you know, or not finally, but coming to gross margins, I'm, it could be a you know, full sort of session on its own. Um, so I'm basically going basically to leave this topic for another time. But I would highlight three things. Uh, first and second, you can't cut your way to growth. Um, but you can grow your way to profitability if you have gross margins, your good gross margins, um, and fixed costs that are actually fixed. So it's worth figuring out and being maniacal about optimizing your gross margins. Um, and then the, the third thing I would say here is some of us probably haven't spent enough time optimizing pricing, and it's just about the easiest thing that you can do to improve cash flow. Uh, and if it's impossible to do, that's a good sign that you have a bad business, and so you may want to think about just shutting down. And then finally, a note on raising money. Uh, probably you've heard this from other people but it's worth having a number of plans that you're confident you can execute, which offer you different periods of runway. I would say never raise money when you have to. It's the worst time to do it. Always raise when you don't need the money. And finally, always raise more money you need than you need and uh, you know, store it away for a rainy or snowy day. 
once you have the money, I would minimize non-investment spend, maximize investment spend, as long as the, you know, the returns are controlled and make sense. And uh, you know, I would leave you with a note to always remember that investors are emotional beings. They'll frequently, do, frequently not do what makes sense and do what doesn't make sense. And so you need to understand and be aware of that and capitalize on it uh, when you can. So that's all from me. Thank you. Hopefully it was helpful. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them later. <laughs>